any other person had any involvement in these murders in any way, that person or persons will be held accountable. This county of Carroll and all that has happened here and all of the sadness associated with this county is unacceptable in a civilized society. It all started on February 13th, 2017, when two young girls went out for a walk and never came home. The next day, Valentine's Day, a grim discovery. Is there somebody else out there? Right now, we have arrested, we have arrested Richard Allen and that's what the courts have allowed us to do. Right now, we have, arrested, we have arrested Richard Allen, and that's what the courts have allowed us to do. And that's what the courts have allowed us to do. We are going to be searching for anyone involved in this case until it's end, until it's over. And today's no different than that. coordination uh, with, a, with a, an event like this and we still don't know exactly who these folks are um, but this is a small community in, in, in rural Indiana but the difference now between now and, and day one is we know about you a lot about you today could be the day sleep well I, uh, I still spend time on that trail and I still spend, still spend time in that small town and I feel for the sheriff's office and the city PD there and the hundreds of people from the state police here in Indiana that have been involved in that. And I believe we'll come to a successful conclusion. Uh, never in my career have I stood in front of something like this. Please be patient with us, please. Uh, we're just beginning. We are, we are just now beginning. The tips keep coming. And um, once that comes in, once that completes itself, then we're going to have to assign another 60 or 80 detectives to this and go back through every single lead that we've ever gotten. I'm confident, you know, I'm confident that there'll be a successful conclusion for Abby and Libby, for Mike and Becky and Anna, and for that community. I'm confident that there will. Do you have a person or persons of interest or do you have a suspect? I'm confident that this will come to a conclusion eventually. Do you think Mr. Allen is the man on that bridge? The judge signed a probable cause affidavit for the arrest of him. I can't wait to tell the story, but today's not the day. Allen has always told investigators that he arrived at the trails around 1.30 p.m. and that he was on the trail that February day. This fall, nearly six years after the murders, authorities decided to review all tips, prompting investigators to take another look at Richard Allen. It seems from the affidavit that police circled back to Allen as a suspect when, quote, investigators in reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative from an officer who interviewed Richard M. Allen in 2017. The affidavit states detectives spoke to Allen again on October 13, 2022, they executed the search warrant the same day and found the gun, which a lab later matched to the unspent bullet found at the scene. So again, why did it take five years for them to circle back to Allen? He placed himself right near the scene. 
He generally matches the description of the man seen in Libby's cell phone video and subsequent sketches authorities have released over time. Now, I'm sure there's a lot more information we're not getting from the affidavit here, but I just don't get it. I, may I be missing here with regard to this affidavit in the five-year period? So basically what we're learning from our reporting is that this delay may have been the result of some sort of clerical error where Alan's name was sort of possibly misfiled and that that prompted there to be a lot of time passing between when he first came on the radar and when they followed up on it. Do you know how many man hours and how much money has been spent on this case overall between all the agencies or yours specifically? Oh, I don't. I would have no idea. Well, millions of dollars. That's a lot. And time and, no, and, and, and anything that we needed. Source close to the investigation confirmed to 13 News a clerical error from an FBI civilian employee led to Richard Allen being overlooked as a suspect in 2017, something the FBI disputes. They tell us the implication that a clerical error by an FBI employee led to years of delay in identifying Allen is misleading and that their review shows FBI employees correctly followed procedure. Prosecutor Nicholas McClellan said in court on Tuesday that he believes Allen did not act alone. A former FBI agent who worked on the investigation told me he wasn't surprised. So during the investigation when I was there, we were still open to any, uh, whether it be one person or multiple people. We still don't know exactly who these folks are. Bob, I'm, I'm in, in, a, in, a, in a year and a half or so, I'll finish my 40th year. I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. I think one of the reasons is because it's captured the attention of the world because it's every town USA. It's every town USA. It's your daughter and it's mine. It's her friend and it's my daughter's friend. I think that's one of the reasons that it's captured the attention of really the globe. I feel a sigh of relief for, um, mainly for the families involved and then for the, the community as a whole. This is not a typical, usual homicide investigation, but they all matter. But this one is, is different. The process is still a piece of all this puzzle. And this isn't over until it's over. And that's where the conviction um, of him. Well, who was there that day, guys? That meeting didn't, it didn't happen. I, I can't believe it. But he's been arrested. Now, obviously, he says he's completely innocent and did not do this. And he, he gets the presumption of innocence. And his original attorneys, who are fighting tooth and nail on this one and also believe in his innocence, are back on the case, Baldwin and Rosie. Um, these two guys have been very aggressive in their defense of Richard Allen. Not a popular position to be in, right? This is the highest profile case. Um, went unsolved for years. Horrific, horrific murder. And you're representing the accused killer. You're not gonna be popular. But they want in on this case. They want to do, they believe in his innocence. So that's a significant factor in all of this because this isn't going to be one of those cases where the defense rolls over. And we've had a few trials like that here on court TV where people, the, the, the evidence is overwhelming and, you know, the defense does their thing but doesn't really do their thing. Completely different in this case. But one thing I can guarantee you, everything we did, we, we did with a purpose. And I will defend them until my final day. Once a judge signs that, that probable cause affidavit, it changes everything. 
and the judge wouldn't have signed off on that probable cause if we didn't have probable cause. Well, I've never been a homicide detective. Well, I've never been a homicide detective. I have a pretty good idea that these detectives are going to reset and um, they're not going to leave a piece of paper unintended. I really hope that people will take a step back from this and, and, and understand the value of every day. Mike and Becky and Anna and Kelsey and the rest of the Delphi community deserve that. Allen's attorneys claim police ignored crime scene evidence that the teens were killed in a ritualistic sacrifice after consulting a Purdue professor who told them there was no evidence to support that. In court documents filed today, Allen's attorneys say in a recent interview, that same professor contradicted what investigators told the defense just last month. According to the defense, the professor told investigators, quote, after viewing the pattern of sticks on the girls, that it was a given that someone was trying to replicate a Germanic rune script, possibly associated with Odinism. That analysis, say Allen's lawyers, was backed up by a Harvard expert. Allen's attorneys claim investigators knew the Purdue professor's name, but tried to hide it from their defense team and also misled the Carroll County prosecutor by telling him they didn't know the professor's name or where to find him. All of it proof the defense claims that investigators misled a judge to get a search warrant for Richard Allen's home. This is the defendant's additional Frank's notice that was filed by Richard Allen and his attorneys on October 3rd, 23. Comes now the accused Richard Allen by and through counsel Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rosie and files the following additional information to supplement the Frank's motion and memorandum previously filed with this court on September 18th, 2023. In support of said notion, the defense states the following. One, that on September 18th, 23, the defense filed its motion for Frank's hearing as well as a memorandum in support of said motion. Two, since filing that motion, the defense has received new discovery that strongly supports the defense's belief that Tony Liggett and Unified Command attempted to conceal from Judge Diener and has since even attempted to hide from the defense that evidence supports that those practicing Odinism were the murderers of Abby and Libby. Three, specifically, Tony Liggett swore under oath at his August 8th, 23 deposition that a Purdue professor did not believe that the sticks found on Abby's and Libby's bodies consisted of, quote, runes, end quote. Look at deposition, pages 74 to 77. Four, furthermore, Sergeant Jerry Holman swore under oath at his August 10th, 23 deposition that a Purdue professor said that the sticks found on the girls did not represent, quote, Odinism or any type of cult worshiping or any type of a group that would have conducted the crime, end quote. Holman deposition, page 63, lines 10 to 20. Five, because of the findings of this Purdue professor, the Unified Command claimed to have essentially abandoned the Odinism aspect of the investigation into the murders of Abby and Libby. Six, in response to the defense request to depose this Purdue professor on September 6, 23, the prosecutor Nick McClelland told the defense via email, quote, as stated before, we are trying to identify the Purdue professor, but no luck yet. Detective Holman has reached out to the FBI and Purdue and has not gotten a response yet. We will continue our endeavors, but may not be able to identify him slash her, end quote. Seven. However, on September 19th, 2023, the day after the Franks Memorandum was filed, where it was revealed that the Purdue professor was, quote, missing, end quote, miraculously, Jerry Holman found the professor, whose name is Jeffrey Turco, and interviewed him. Eight. However, in the interview, Jerry Holman apologized to Turco for the three to four weeks that it took him, Holman, to sit down and talk with Turco. Nine, this means that Holman was aware of the Purdue professor's identity since mid to late August, but nonetheless told Nick McClellan that Unified Command could not locate the Purdue professor and furthermore, that they may not ever be able to find the Purdue professor. 10, however, after it was obvious that the Purdue professor would probably quote out end quote himself as the missing Purdue professor following the Franks Memorandum, 
Holman went and interviewed the Purdue professor the day after the Franks Memorandum was filed. 11. Why would Holman and the Unified Command try to hide the name of the Purdue professor, even risking ridicule for the absurdity that they could not remember his name? The answer is obvious once the taped statement was played. Dr. Turco stated that after viewing the pattern of the sticks on the girls that, quote, it was a given, end quote, that someone was trying to replicate a Germanic runic script. Furthermore, Dr. Turco consulted with a colleague from Harvard who had even more knowledge on runes, and this Harvard professor was in agreement with Turco. Furthermore, Dr. Turco stated that Odinism is an extreme neo-pagan slash neo-heathenism ideology that has right-wing racist connotations. Furthermore, Dr. Turco stated that according to 19th century sources, that Vikings practiced ritualistic killings and sacrifices. Furthermore, Dr. Turco stated that although he could not necessarily interpret these runes, that the stick configurations were pretty clearly runic and that he, quote, could certainly imagine that this was somebody's idea that when you do human sacrifice, you carve runes. There are some poetic sources that would sort of support that idea that somebody might have come across. That scenario seems entirely plausible to me, end quote. Turco taped statement 15 to 1550. Furthermore, Dr. Turco discussed how runes were thought to have, quote, magical significance and would be used in incantations, in rituals, and that there is a sacrificial connection in mythological poetry. These were things, again, where somebody who was sort of an Odin, quote, fanboy, end quote, would likely come across, end quote. 12. That on September 18th, September 21st, and September 27th, 2023, the state of Indiana made available to the defense a total of 14 hard drives, five flash drives, three disks, and what appeared to be hundreds of pages of paperwork. 13. Particularly, contained in the state of Indiana's September 27th, 2023 evidence drop was a thumb drive that contained an interview of a, quote, Jeffrey Turco, end quote. This was not marked as a Purdue professor. 14. It seems apparent by the timing of events that Tony Liggett and Unified Command knew the Purdue professor's name and wanted to hide his name and his findings from the defense as Turco's conclusions supported the defense and opposed the prosecution and Liggett and Holman's sworn statements. Therefore, apparently in what seems like a complete harebrained scheme, Holman and Liggett decided to claim that they did not know the professor's name hoping that this would put an end to the defense looking into the Purdue professor. However, once the memorandum made it clear that the Purdue professor would certainly be found at some point in time, it took Holman one day to locate Dr. Turco and interview him about his findings of 2017. 15. Again, Franks requires a preliminary finding that law enforcement has acted intentionally or with reckless disregard for the truth when being accused of concealing evidence from the judge who signed the warrant. It would be difficult to find a more outrageous set of facts to support that Liggett and the Unified Command intentionally concealed the Odinite information from Judge Diener. If Liggett and Unified Command were willing to try to get away with concealing a Purdue professor from defense counsel, then it is easy to see that they would have no problem concealing all the evidence detailed in the Franks Memorandum from Judge Diener as well. Wherefore, defense counsel respectfully files his additional Franks notice and would request that this court factor in this new filing into its ruling on the defense's request for a Franks hearing.
uh, keep in mind that there uh, the likeliness of the possibility of, of more than one person. Uh, we're, we're not saying that the person, that the voice that you heard is the same as this person here. This is all very complicated, very involved, and as much as we would like to tell you everything, more importantly, we want to solve the crime. I also wanted to see if the sheriff would agree that he felt there were so-called signatures left by the perpetrator at the crime scene. The former prosecutor of the case, Robert Ives, told us they existed. He told us that, in his opinion, there are two or three signatures left by the killer at the crime scene. Mm -hmm. And you said you agree in part with that? Mm -hmm. A crime scene will tell you a story. Just stand back and observe, watch, see what it's going to tell you. That's why evidence is important. Once you put all those pieces of evidence together like a huge puzzle, it can tell you that story. And so, yes, I agree with what Prosecutor Ives said uh, that there's things that existed there at that crime scene that when the day comes, put them all back together and here's the story it's going to tell. Don't let that C word scare you. Don't let that C word scare you and think that this is over. Don't let the C word scare you. It's just something you don't expect to happen. It's something you don't know what to say. A week later. <laughs> yes, sir. The city's 27-year-old mayor grew up here. We did what all kids do, played around in the creek, played in the woods. The same places Libby and Abby were hiking, places generations of children have played. That creek is almost spiritual to the people of this community. It's something that every generation has grown up playing in. It's something that I wouldn't say it's a rite of passage, but I think every child plays somewhere along the Deer Creek at one point or another in this community. Streets used to be pretty empty after dark, and now with new businesses within the community, there's a vibrancy, there's a sense of life. What they have is they've got the basics taken care of. Now the town can focus on its economic development opportunities, attracting people to be here, and starting to move the town forward. We're heading into really a new era. It's kind of the renaissance for Delphi. Many people are returning, people who were born here. That is coupled with people who see it for the first time and would like to move here or invest money in the community, or just come for a weekend for the entertainment and enjoy the Canal Center and all of the other amenities that we have in town. Once the Oracle took off, Delphi took off with it.
It became the focus for a whole range of other activities as people began to come here in huge numbers. And it was all good business for a thriving city which surrounded the sanctuary. It's all symbolism and it's all in some way interacting with, with energy to manipulate energy in a certain way. Mm. The satanic rituals are, are all... The, the, the way they're conducted is to manipulate the energetic field. Um, and what they do is um, do the same rituals in the same places over and over and over again. And what that does is it thins... because. Um, what these rituals are doing, like I said earlier, is they're interacting with these uh, lower astral, quote, gods, demons, entities. And the more they do it in the same place, they thin out the dimensional difference at that point between our world and that world. And I've been described, been described to me many times by Satanists how um, these entities in the major rituals slip through from their dimension into this one and appear. Mm -hmm appear in front of the Satanists. There's a huge void, um, and there's a huge, uh, amount of fear. This story hits home with every parent, every family, every 13, 14 year old kid in America. The murders of two young girls in a small Indiana town has become a national story. I don't think you have to be embarrassed if you're scared right now. A lot of people in town are scared. Everybody's, everybody's always been on edge. I've sensed it when I'm here. I've sensed it walking down Main Street, uh, coming up here for dinner. I just, I've sensed it. Attendant, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, I'll just start it on a question. Uh, <clears throat> Superintendent, we're on five years now. Um, what does this case mean to you? Oh, gosh. It, it would take me a while to explain it, but I, I think it's the um, it's totality of, of, of evil in my career, me personally. But the beauty of it is I get to represent some just some amazing, amazing people that have given their entire life to this. Um, they're one of the last things I think about every day and one of the first things I think of in the morning. Wow. Um, what is the focus of your investigation right now and what is the evidence telling you? Well, I'm not going to talk about the evidence. Um, I think we've, we've, done a, we've done a fair job of doing that over the course of these last five years. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of speculation, Rich, about what we know and what we don't know. I think most people's intentions are good when they've done their own courses of investigations globally. Um, but I, I'm, I'm pretty confident in the place where we are right now. And um, eventually the world's gonna know what we do. I still get between probably 25 and 40 direct tips a week right here, literally from around the world. Uh, Germany, Australia, of late, Italy, uh, and then almost every state in the country. And, you know, I'll forward that, I'll forward that up to our investigators in, in, uh, in Carroll County. Um, Tony Liggett from the Cass County, or the, from the Carroll County Sheriff's Office, and, uh, Toe Blensenby and, and, and Jerry Holman and Dave Vito, or her, uh, Jay Harper, are troopers that are assigned to this. And it's just amazing to me that they have that same energy and the same gumption today that they did almost five years ago. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing to watch. Again, there's speculation about what that means, what was actually said, who said it, was it connected, was it the same, was it the same voice? Um, and uh, again, that's an investigative component of this and, and uh, I'm not worthy to discuss it. From what we've seen, there's, there's footage of the girl, of, of, this, of this suspect, of this person of interest from, I believe, Libby's phone. Is there surveillance video of the girls at any time going Rich, I, I'm doing this interview to talk about the effects that, that this gruesome crime has had on a community, on a state, and on a nation. 
I'm not going to talk about the evidence. It's not one. Okay. Okay. I've got nothing. Okay. New, I've got nothing new to release. Okay. Uh, I'll switch gears here. I'm sorry. Um, Social media has kind of tried to devour this case. They're, right. they're consumed right. with it. Um, has social media affected the investigation, positive or negative in any way? You know, way? that's a great question. And I think we have, we have this amazing ability to communicate today. And I don't understand it. I'm not going to pretend to. Uh, but what I do know is that we, can, we have been able to glean information literally from around the globe. The intelligence that we've received, not only on this case, but on, on many other criminal cases and criminal matters around the country has been extraordinary. So I think when people start doing their own investigation and start comparing what they think, that creates problems. We ask them not to do that. Um, there, there are a lot of people that look like the sketches that we've released. And then when you blow that out there with a picture of somebody that they think, next to a sketch, imagine what it does to that person if, if they're not involved at all, right? So we've tried to be very, very careful and very cautious there with how we've done that. Um, but I gotta tell you, I, every time a tip pops up on my screen, I smile because I'm so grateful. Now, the downside of that is we can't respond to every one of them. I get so many of these where people want a direct response and an explanation as to what what, what, an explanation from me as to what they're thinking. And, and for obvious reasons, I, I just can't do that. But um, I think it's been an amazing uh, effort in collecting an extraordinary amount of data and intelligence, and then how are we going to collate that? Because I think the vast majority of people are doing what they think is right. I hope that answers the question, because it's, really, it's, it's a really good point, and it's been something like I've never seen in my entire career. How can the public continue to help with this case? Keep doing what they're doing. Keep doing what they're doing. I hope that this has brought a light, a, a, maybe even a glimmer of hope, um, to monitoring what happens out there from a parental perspective, a peer perspective, a relative's perspective, a neighbor's perspective, whatever that might be. Because again, of the way in which we have, the way we have the ability to communicate. And finally, what I'll say to that is we should never, law enforcement should never talk about what we, we think. We should only talk about what we know. And it's easy for someone else, for a person out there trying to do the right thing, to make what they think what they know. You see what, I'm, you see what yeah. I mean? And it's really important. I know you see it all the time. And it's really important, as, as particularly as we we face head on a complete planet that's out of balance right now. And the vitriol and the negativity associated with every single thing we do. And it just breaks my heart, whether it's race, whether it's, mm -hmm. it's white or black or Asian or, or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. It seems that we, if we don't agree, we hate each other and I don't hate anybody for trying to help us. So I think when people start doing their own investigation and start comparing what they think, that creates problems. We ask them not to do that. How can the public continue to help with this case? Keep doing what they're doing. Keep doing what they're doing. So I think when people start doing their own investigation and start comparing what they think, that creates problems. We ask them not to do that. How can the public continue to help with this case? Keep doing what they're doing keep doing what they're doing. How can the public continue to help with this case? Keep doing what they're doing. Keep doing what they're doing. I hope that this has brought a light, a, a, maybe even a glimmer of hope, um, to monitoring what happens out there. Yeah, it's I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna talk about that specifically, but what I will say about it is it, it's, it adds, again, a little bit of weight to um, a very complicated murder investigation. So I'd much rather have it than not, I think is how I'd respond to that. And that's why all of us have a little bit of piece of the puzzle here, or a piece of the pie or whatever. I, I wanna meet with Mike and Becky and, and, and Anna and um, I wanna tell them we did it. That's why I wanna tell them. We, collect, we collectively did it. 
I, I want to meet with Mike and Becky and, and, and Anna and um, I, I want to meet with Mike and Becky and, and, and Anna and um, the lead detective on the Delphi case tells me although the killer thinks that he got away every single day lab techs are working to process evidence including DNA that was left at the crime scene. It takes a lot of time and, and we want to be very thorough so we want to take our time make sure our I's are dotted T's are crossed but it's a tough case. A case Indiana State Police First Sergeant Jerry Holman has worked every day for the past six months. We're getting closer every day I know that's cliche, but we are. Dozens of state, local, and federal agencies still working around the clock to track down the man they believe killed Abby Williams and Libby German while the girls were out on a walk on the Delphi Historic Trails in February. We're stronger than ever. Police tell me they've conducted hundreds of interviews, followed up on thousands of leads, and served dozens of search warrants to find clues the killer may have left behind. Was there DNA evidence found at the scene of the crime? I think at every crime scene you have, you're going to have DNA. We're still working on identifying who's all DNA we have there. Along with DNA evidence, police also have the suspect's voice. Police tell me Libby recorded the killer's voice on her cell phone, telling the girls to go down the hill. Investigators say she hit record after he approached them near the Monon High Bridge. Today, Sergeant Holman tells me they recovered even more audio from Libby's phone, which was found with the girls at the crime scene. We've only released a portion of it. Uh, there are some others that, that we think could help us, but uh, again, protecting the integrity of the investigation is, is the key here. So we, we can't release everything we have because there's only certain people that know the details. And if we release everything, then we get into possible false confessions. Sergeant Holman says several people have come forward and said they saw the killer walking on the trails the day Abby and Libby were killed. Those people helped develop this composite sketch that was released last month. Is there anything we did or didn't do that jeopardized this case? No. I still believe somebody knows. Somebody knows what happened for whatever reason they won't come forward. I think at every crime scene you have, you're going to have DNA. We're still working on identifying who's all DNA we have there. We're still working on identifying who's all DNA we have there. We're still working on identifying who's all DNA we have there. Uh, this is in regards to the Delphi murders. Uh, the defense team recently leaked a uh, memorandum and they named their theories and also <clears throat> their version of events. And they named uh, Patrick Westfall as a suspect, not only in the Delphi case, but they're trying to tie him to the Flora case. Um, me and Brad were military. We were in Afghanistan together on my second tour. They got and linked back up after I got out of the hospital years later. And we bumped into each other on social media. And then he started talking about how he went to practice officer true since he was seeing me do it on my deployment. Okay. We would just got done with all of our stuff, eating ceremony. We went out and played at the park with all the kids and everything. You know, me and my lady had seven kids at the house and he had a couple boys. It was time for kids activities. And the kids had went out and collected their own branch. And then I was slicing it into discs for them, and then they were carving their own runes on those wooden discs. Um, but they also said that um, some, I think her name was Amber. Is it Amber Holder? I know Brad was married. I went and I know he was married at the end of our deployment. I'm not sure if Amber was the wife. I don't. The I'm not, of, well, she's mentioned in the. She's. It was a new girl he started dating shortly after I told him to pack up and roll the hell out. Yeah, apparently she took a lie detector test and he told her that you were responsible for the murders. That's what they put in the memorandum. Yeah, 
I didn't know she was taking a lot of text to test, but I know that she did make that statement. Um, something about she was asking about me, trying to find out information, and the guys of one of her girlfriends supposedly had a date with me or some shit. Yeah, um, something weird. Like they were recording the call or something. I was, I've been trying to figure out if Amber is the one that Brad had his sons with, or if this was the no. new girl that new he girl. met through somebody else. New. It's the new girl. The new girl. Yeah. The okay. wife isn't mentioned at all. Well, I can't comment or speculate about Amber. I was under the assumption it was the first woman he was married to then because, I'm not trying to say this the wrong way, her you know, struck my own ego, but that woman was going around and she was fucking everybody that man knew behind his back. Even people that we were in Afghanistan with, like, just absolutely demasculated that dude. That's awful. Uh, he couldn't turn his back without her going and crashing somebody he knew. And he brought her to my house one time, and that bra was just staring at me like a goddamn double cheeseburger, bud. And I was just like, Brad, you don't need to bring her back over here. Dude. I got all the ladies here, families here. And I was thinking in my head, the reason that she was asking about me and Brad got all shit show sideways was he was trying to keep her from coming to my house and cheat on him with another one of his buddies. So he was giving her the whole, oh. You said you guys like right around the time of the murders, there was a ritual that went wrong and Brad, Brad said, Oh, um, um, I can't hang around with him. He's a dangerous guy. And it was right after like a ritual that had gone wrong. Like it just doesn't seem even true. That, no, no. The, when I told Brad to beat Brit, it was in my living room. I, we didn't go deep out into the woods to do our sambles and our bloats. We did this shit in my backyard, right there in Delphi, right by Canal Park. Um, like, I mean, just a couple blocks away from the courthouse, the, like the downtown, if you want to call it downtown, Delphi is like two miles wide by two miles, dude. It's, it's a rich and deep little Amish town, basically. We did this shit in my backyard. We weren't going out packing, you know, seven to ten kids and a handful of adults out in some deep, remote wilderness scene with creeks and all this shit. It really happened in my backyard. When I told Brad to beat bricks, it was in my living room in front of everybody. That's just the person I am. I'm not I'm going to be all bashful and sidestep somebody and Jim all around. If there's a problem, I'm fucking bringing it up to the surface. We're going to take care of it right here, right now. If we can get past it, we get past it. If not, everybody go their own ways. And he picked up off the truth because of me. Uh, while he was going through his divorce with his, apparently the kid's mom is not Amber. Can't remember the broad's name. He was staying with his parents. Okay. His excuse is, we, we had found out that he was going to church, Christian church, every weekend and then he was coming to my house and playing off true and i'm not one of those half in half out guys either i'm serious about this lifestyle i love off the true it's who i am it's who i've been for a long time and i don't like the phony shit and it's like brad and you've been going to church dude oh yeah, yeah i go to church every sunday it's like well you're coming over here and you're you know in my house with me doing also true, bud. You, I mean, you, you don't do both, man. You need to pick one or the other. You know, you got to either be all in or you're all out. He's like, well, I guess I'm all out then. And that was, that was the end of it. I said, well, grab anything you got in my house and beat bricks, bro. He, he did it. He left the book back there. And I don't even know remember what happened with the damn thing, but he never came back for it. He refused to come and get any of this shit. And I had some numerous times come get your shit, man. I got the stuff in my house. You know, I ain't going to sit there and have that on my conscience. So you call me a thief, so come get it. And then be on your merry way. He never would. He never would return a phone call. Never talked to me again. But that's where I fall out was. It wasn't a ceremony gone bad. He was out fucking playing Christian and Austin at the same time. I don't like that. Um, who's Elvis? 
You know, I had to have my girlfriend get on Facebook because I don't have it and actually pull up a picture so I can see this dude. So you have no that connection with this guy. That I ever met. Wow. Huh? So you have no connection to this guy, Elvis. Never met the guy. Never heard his name. I was finding out through readings and listening to you and a couple other people. I bumped into videos. This cat was down in Russellville, Rushville, whatever, around that shit brick Johnny Messer. You know, when the Vinlanders got together, the BSC. Yeah. Me and the other guy with the Vinlanders, we pulled Johnny to the side and took him outside. We're like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, you can't be doing that outside with us. That's not how we hold ourselves. That's not how we stand as Vinlanders. That, that is so just disgustingly dishonest and dirty and just low of a human being that's supposed to have pride and, you know, some bit of truth about themselves. And then shortly later, like, we told him, don't ever bring her back around. And we told her at the same time, don't come back around. We don't need that shit. It's, that's disgusting. And that's just something lower than low. So she didn't like us at all from being there at the beginning. And then when we found out that they were running around Rushville spinning counterfeit 20s. Oh, so they were, con, they were con artists. I drove my ass. Huh? They were con artists. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that falls back to that Wokey and shit, the trickster, the con artist, the kin killer, the brother killer. I don't like that. And I always picked up those kind of vibes off him. He's just a shady son of a bitch. And you don't know until you hang around with someone long enough to pick up on it. Sometimes you get it right away, but other times it takes time. That's why the probate process in the hang around process with the club back in the day was so long. We're going to find out everything about you. We're going to run a background check on you. We're going to vet you through a private detective and we're going to watch you for a minimum of a year and a half to two years before, you know, you are a, a, what we consider a brother. Sounds like a prospect. And they felt quick. I got in the car myself. I drove all the way down to Rushville and on the way, I'm telling her, pack up all of his shit. I want his anything that has club-related pictures on it, words on it, every single damn thing that he's gotten while he's been a hang around and a probate. And I said, oh, I'm pulling his patch. I'm coming to get all the shit. And I did. And that was the end of Johnny Messer's time around me. But there never was a time there was an Elvis, what, Fields? Elvis Fields? Yeah, Elvis Fields. That dude never came around. We don't recruit. We don't recruit. I know this reporter says, oh, we go out and prey on handicapped people and these weak-minded, you know, long roles of society to do our bidding and shit. Ventilators don't recruit, but I'm going to make that clean and clear. You come to the ventilators, we don't come to you. So where does all this racism talk we come from? Get- Is it a racist organization? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Nationalist. Nationalist? If you want to call that nationalism, call it nationalism. If you want to call it skinhead, call it skinhead. And say racist, terrorist, Nazi, whatever. The name of it is the Intelligence Report. It is the Southern Poverty Law Center's quarterly magazine. And I'm in this one. This mm-hmm. is spring of 2018, issue number 164. I'm in this for the Ben leadership. Um, you know, page 24. But this magazine has all the listed hate groups and all the terrorist organizations and all this other shit. Basically, anybody who does not hold their belief structure, there were some hardcore-ass sons of bitches in it. There really was. And I ain't going to lie and bullshit and smoke screen nobody. VSC had some honky kong sons of bitches in it. There were some bad dudes in there and some bad shit had happened. I'm a nationalist, I'll give you that. I'm a constitutional nationalist. I swore no to the constitution of this country and I'm tired of seeing this country bleed and weep and suffer. So that makes me a Nazi bud and I'll be one. 
they say that the motivation was, had something to do with one of the victim's mothers dating outside of a race and that's what it's where it kind of stems from so they're putting race yeah, into it and I, then, saw that. I heard you say that and then also they brought up flora because you lived up the street from flora and if you're some racist son of a bitch of course you did that too right oh yeah oh yeah I got us out of the house with the black mold in it and got us into Delphi. But it was, I mean, Florida is just as small as Delphi. So yeah, I literally lived right around the corner from the house fire that the, the mother ran out of and left her four little girls in to burn to death. Do you remember and when it happened? No one likes to talk about the house. Whatever happened, a fire got started inside their apartment. From what I understand, and the mother just up and straight out the goddamn house. She didn't get her kids. She didn't go back in to get her kids. She ran straight out of the house as soon as she knew that there was a fire. And we're talking a small area. It would take you seconds to scoop up kids and haul ass. She ran out of the house and stood there in the yard while that goddamn house burned and the little girls died there. Have you heard anything about what, like what might have caused that? You hear anything like out on the street about it? Who might have did it? No, no. I mean, I was in Delphi at the time. I heard about the house fire, and we saw all the news reports about, you know, all the little girls that went up in it. And I mean, it's sadder than shit, but it really was. I'm a, I'm a parent. I got four kids too. I get it. I don't know what the hell I would do if I hadn't lost one of my four, let alone all of them. But you best believe I come out looking like some crispy swamp thing. Either I'm, either I'm going to paradise, you know, dying in a house fire retrieving kids, or uh, you know what I mean. I'm, I'm not gonna stand there in the front yard and let all this shit go down. But we never heard. There never was a suspected arson. It never was labeled as that, as far as I'm understanding it was never labeled as arson or anything the fire that started inside the home yeah i believe uh there was While an accelerant there. yeah somebody dumped an accelerant and lit the lit the house on fire oh well you know shit that i don't when they asked me about alan i thought that they were talking i know some other allens in the living delphi one of them died from an overdose a year ago. He had a brother. So I said, oh, is he related to so-and-so? And they're like, well, no, no, no. This is someone totally different. And I, you know, I never met the guy. I've never seen the damn guy. They even showed me his picture when I went in to speak to police. Oh, wait. The they they office. interviewed you? They interviewed you after they arrested Richard Allen? My... First interviews were at the very beginning of the whole thing back in like what 2017. When they brought me back in the beginning of August, I do believe it was this yes, beginning of August. And that's when they started asking me all the crazy ass questions about how Austin True can be related to is Austin True related to Satanism in any way? Is there any satanic rituals? And I'm like, fuck no, dude. I, I gave him the rundown and told him, shame on you guys. Whoever put that idea in your head, shame on them too. So, they got shit to do with it. So were they trying to connect uh, Richard yeah. Allen to it in some way? No. They they never, after asking me if I knew him or ever had any interaction with him before, they never mentioned him again. Any time during the interview where it was just mouth to mouth, or even when I sat through the four and a half hour polygraph, they were asking bunch of other questions during the polygraph so you must have passed have anyone did you organize anything did you personally know assist your car rides to organize it's a, i mean every damn question in the world i mean every, like i said everywhere from did you personally take a knife and ever stab anybody did you organize anything? Do you know who did it? I mean, every single question I can think of in, for four and a half hours. Did I submit a DNA again? 
It's been on file since I went to Iraq. It's been on file since I got a felony back in the day. And then they took more DNA at the mouth-to-mouth interview beginning of August. So they and must like have DNA. Later, like four days later, actually, I came back to the polygraph. Yeah, they must have DNA then. Mm-hmm. And we were all told from the beginning there was no DNA in this case. So when he asked me for DNA, I'm like, ah. So you guys did have DNA in this case, or otherwise you wouldn't be asking for fuck the mind. I said that also begs the question, the hell are you doing with Richard Allen in jail? And if, uh, if you're still looking for other people's DNA, that must mean you have DNA in the case and his didn't match. Well, we, we don't know a whole lot about Richard Allen. What do you know about him? Just living in the same town or whatever? Not a damn thing. I'm still going to be known... As the pagan cult leader killer Delphi. I don't know. And they got your alibi, right? They mentioned that, that you're at home with your yeah. son. Yeah, the FBI, like I said, they came to my house. They sat down with me at the table. They even they even made comments about the Denlander shit. Like, I mean, I remembered intently, oh, what that ring stand for? What's that flag on the wall? And I'm like, gentlemen, I know who you guys are. You guys know who I am. <laughs> I know that that big, thick folder on the bottom there is a little dossier about me. Let's just cut the bullshit and get down to it, you know? And they were like, fair enough, fair enough. And we sat and talked about everything. They're in my house for over an hour. So I try to tell these cops, dude, I've had my ass rocked in Afghanistan, Iraq. I've been knocked out. I got bad memory problems. I got neural damage and shit. And like, it affects my life pretty bad, man. I can barely remember what I have for breakfast most days. And that's no bullshit. I'm not going to remember what I was doing six years ago. Said, but the FBI has a folder from an interview they sat down at my table in my living room and did with me. If you guys want to refresh your brain caps, go get that piece of paper out and read it. It's going to give you a better explanation of what I was doing then than I ever could now. There's no way I ever could. I knew I lived in Delphi. I knew I had a red Ford Flex with a white roof. And that's about all I can tell you about those days, bud. So what are you looking to do? Are you going to try to um, sue Richard Allen's defense team? How, yeah. What? How yeah, could- absolutely. I'm going after everyone. And I'd, I'd really like to see his Odin report. I'd like to know what was in it. So I have an idea of just how twisted up this dude was taking everything because if he's just being a parrot, if he's just quick case parody, shit from the Odin report straight over into the memorandum, there's not a whole lot that I can do. I have found that out so far. So if he's just flat out just twisted and twisting everything into a big spiral, what I can, but until that Odin report is able to be seen, I don't know. I'm currently getting going to be calling the uh, Indiana Bar Association today, and I'm going to get a more detailed list of libel defamination attorneys. And I'm going to contact the Indiana University, Purdue University, IUPUI Law School down in Indy, and see if there's any young foaming at the mouth ready to make a name for themselves law students that, you know, want to jump on this bandwagon and make a name for themselves. Cause I don't think it's going to be hard to prove just absolute horseshit slander libel from this attorney and the way he did things. And, um, but before we end the call, um, what did you, what have you heard, you know, about what might've happened out there in, uh, in Delphi? That's the question that ended the interview with the state police. I let them son the bitches test. They asked me the same question. I told them you guys don't want to know my opinion. They insisted. So I gave it to them both barrels. There is something absolutely down, dark, and dirty in Carroll County, Indiana. Everyone who lives there knows it. Most people ain't got the balls to say it. I have for years, and that's what's always put me in the crosshairs. This Nick McClellan hates my guts. The law enforcement out there hates my guts. I've had to go to the mayor's office, the previous mayor, 
and in the form of police chiefs call us and tell them, you guys got goddamn cops that are constantly sitting across the street from my house watching me, getting the hell out of here. I don't care if you like to do that. I'm telling you it was a big ordeal. <laughs> my opinion, with the dirty sideways shit that's going on in the police department, Nick McLean is a dirty son of a bitch. He absolutely is a backdoor, scandalous, manipulative human being. He's got people sitting in the county jails on no bond hold while he's in their old lady's DM trying to get with them. And I'm not kidding you. Wow. He has family in the police department. He has families in the courthouse. Then McClellan's got a pretty good hold over this town. We've had a cop shortly around the time of this uh, Abby Libby incident. They pulled over a couple girls in town. And something in the lines of some sexual shit's going to go down if you guys want to get out of this ticket, basically. One of the girls was recording it. That cop was arrested on a Friday and had resigned by Monday, so he couldn't be charged with anything. That qualified immunity horse shit that prosecutors and cops have. Cover this dude's that. Never made no big mainstream fuss or anything about it. We had a judge before Diener, and now my opinion, the guy was had a good personality. He was a fair judge. He was calm, level-headed, and he kept Nick McClellan at bay with his just excessive lust for fucking going after people in the courtroom. Also, Curtis Fouts. Judge Fouts had to resign because he got caught on a live stream at an escort's house. Yeah, I heard now, about that. Dude, get it, get it how you want it. I ain't mad. If you want to go out and get your jollies off, get your jollies off, man. Dude like women. He like getting it. So, I, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and be mad. I mean, he wasn't going out and doing nothing perverted with underage girls or nothing, as far as I know. But there was a disagreement going down between him and a girl's house that he was currently at. And he was basically in the lines of telling her something's going to happen and it's going to happen this way or I'm going to get the boss involved. And the girl just happened to be live streaming this shit and so showed the judge walking back and forth in his underwear in her apartment or wherever. But uh, Nick McClellan drives around Carroll County and his front vanity plate is the boss. What? There's a, there's a lot of dark, dirty crap my opinion, this is somebody in the city council, somebody in the police, courthouse, something in that circle, that group. The reason that they ain't found who they're looking for is because they're looking out and not in. And that's what's believe the reason that that cop killed himself in the park. Oh, yeah, I know all about that. The cover up that's going on. Yes, the reason everyone believes the reason that that cop, now this is just. This ain't, I don't have hard factual evidence. That cop killed himself over the cover-up and he couldn't deal with it. Oh, well, he's he's a guilty son of a bitch. He's a low-down, dirty um, skinhead. He's a killer. What do you have to say to those people who are accusing you with no real proof other than what was said in this mer memorandum, which is already filled with um, half half truths, if not bold-faced lies? What do you have to say to those people? They're going to be who they're going to be. It's human nature to always want to latch on to the deepest, darkest, ugliest information you can get and hold on to it. It's human nature. I get it, but it doesn't mean that they're right, and it'll never make them right, no matter how angry and bitter they are about it or how much crap that they talk. People are going to talk. Uh, here's Patrick. I didn't live in Florida when the fire happened. I was living in Delphi at that time. Uh, Patrick says, 
The girls were my kids' friends from town and school. I didn't know them the best, but I knew them. I mean, he's basically what? Uh, the skinhead cult leader murderer now. That crazy son of a bitch. The bloodlust. Uh, Janie Lane is saying, are you a skinhead? Well, I asked him if he was a racist or part of a racist organization. He didn't say no. He said he's nationalist, a nationalist constitutionalist. Not quite sure what that is. Uh, Patrick says, I heard on one of your videos that Richard Allen was military. Yeah, I think he's um, here. Let me see if I can find that. Let me pull up the defense memo. Oh, wait, I might already have it. No. Oh, yeah, here it is. National Guard. Yeah, he was in the National Guard, apparently. 